This video is an introduction to the game Narvik from the Europa series. It is the uh, German campaign in Norway, well, and uh, Norwegian and Allied uh, campaign in Norway too. Previously on my channel I featured a game of Operation Visa Rubunk, which is uh, the same campaign, the invasion of Norway. You can see from the cover of that game that Norway um, is a very long, sort of relatively thin stretch of land. And indeed the map for that game was a long stretch of map, thin stretch. Um, all the way from uh, the sort of southern tip, Oslo here, to Nordheim, Trondheim, sorry, there, and we have Narvik here, and then Troma right at the top there. But you can see the map included only Norway, and of course some sea area. Now because the Narvik map is from the Europa series, whose aim is to allow you to fight the whole um, World War II in the West. It connects to its other geographical areas. So we have here Sweden. This is the national boundary where the Operation Visa Rubin map ended. We have um, Oslo here. Um, these little circles that I'm using bottle tops to mark out the all important airfields um, on the map. There's two at Oslo. Um, there we have a uh, Trondheim here. Or is it there? And the airfields. Trondheim's there. Airfield next to it. All the way up to Narvik. Airfield there up to we actually have a place, sorry about the darkness here, Alta, which is actually um sort of the end of Norway. The, the other half of the hex is a sea hex, so that's actually a port. And then we have um Finland here, part of Finland, and then the continuation of Sweden there. So uh, the game actually contains all the forces for Sweden, so um, Sweden can join the Second World War if you're playing that whole campaign. Um, so you can see it's not a long, thin map. It is quite a big map. It's two map sections. Um, but I don't need Sweden and Finland for that because I'm only playing Narvik um, itself. So I, I put the turn record chart and the Vich point chart there. And then a helpful sheet here, which comes with the game. It's actually one of two sheets um, that is for integrating it into the whole Europa game. It shows the Norwegian mobilisation. So if you're not playing Narvik, but at some point somebody decides to invade Norway, this is how they mobilise. You have another sheet in the box for the Swedish mobilisation and, as I said, all their forces. Then uh, you've got counter-inventory. And uh, here's a very helpful Norwegian location. So if you can't remember where Harstad is, it tells you which map and which hex it's in. I've also added some useful information which I wish they'd actually put, which is a, a key of um, distances between, in this case, distances between all the airfields. So there's seven airfields. So for example, um, uh, you actually have an airfield. Oh, I didn't put that on here. You actually have an airfield here in Denmark. Denmark is um, a, a German friendly at the beginning of the game. This line here marks an area uh, where Allied Norwegian shipping cannot enter because it's effectively patrolled and mined by the German forces. The rest of this area, the North Atlantic, is free for Allied um, shipping. But anyway, so um, say you've got a, the airfield near Christiansand there, and then you've got the airfield near Narvik there, which is called Badu Foss. You have Badu Foss to Christiansand is 57 hexes, which is very important when you're working out um, 
possible transportation, bombing, or um, other air um, operations. Um, and uh, you also have these off-map things. So this represents airfields in Germany, in Hamburg, as it happens. They're 13 hexes away from these points. So again, I use that. So from German 13 to the Oslo Westfield is 11, um, which tells you, because at the start of the game, there's no German air forces on the map. They're in these off-map Block boxes as it were so some of them can only just get here they've only just got enough range up to here for example um, so th these are sort of helpful things which just saves you counting out hexes all the time um, so that's that's the map and let, let me just mention um, so the turn record chart each turn is four days long and you have 15 turns uh, the turns will actually go quite quickly. I wrote on here um, the sequence of play. So you have a reinforce. So the Germans go first. Reinforcements, movement, air phase. The air phase consists of um, these various phases. So you you assign missions. The non-phaser can intercept AA combat. Then you perform your missions. Then you the phasing player returns, and the non-phasing player returns. Then you have combat, then you have exploitation phase, which is for combat and motorised units. Um, so are you not for sort of standard infantry units? So it's a simple sequence of play and it, it um, plays quite quickly. And obviously the more units on the map, the slower it, it will take. But I played out um, the first turn and a half of the game already before sort of resetting it because I learned quite a lot about the initial invasion during that. Um, for example, one very important thing You'll notice is that the air phase comes between movement and combat so for example you can move into and you've got four day turn but if you move into um, an enemy occupied air base you cannot then land your air transports that turn until you've cleared it through combat and then in the next turn you could land them so um that's the uh, that's that then um the victory point chart, okay, the, the key to the campaign. The victory conditions run, so you've got potentially at hundreds, um, 0 to 50 points decisive German victory, up to 100 points marginal German victory, and then, then it goes to the allied victory. Now, two most important points are these two. If the allies hold Narvik and all adjacent hexes at the end of the game, they get 100 points. And the same for any point in Norway south of the A weather line, except for those two at the end of the game. They get 200 points immediately. So if that's all that happens, they will win a, a decisive Allied victory. Then the rest of the points uh, they gain for destroying um, German units, and the Germans subtract victory points for destroying Allied units allied and uh, not Norwegian units though so note that all the Norwegian units could be destroyed in the Germans game no victory points for that so what this tells you is that Germans have to hold these two places at the end of the game i.e um, they need to have Narvik where was it here completely under control and then the A weather line is here so Above that, it's kind of like winter weather, the um, movement point costs increase. And anything except for two ports, the Christiansund and I think it was this one. Um, so there's one, so that includes Trondheim, one, two, three, Bergen, four, Stavanger, five, Christiansand, not so on six, and then all these ones around Oslo have to be controlled by the Germans with no allies within them um, or, or at least yeah they must be controlled them at the end of the game um so uh that's a, the, the Germans have to sort of completely hold the coastal region of this area and be at least next to Narvik up there contesting it or else um unless the allies are poured in all their forces and sort of more or less every single one was destroyed um, 
by the Germans there, they're not going to win the game. So uh, that tells you a lot about what you have to do. You have to take that error as the Germans and you have to contest that fiercely, and which is hard because it's hard to get supplies up to there, which we'll get mentioned later. So um, that's that. Um, here's the... Uh, so you've got train effects chart. As I say, there's south of the weather line and north of the weather line. And then there's um, the extra movement points costs for rivers, fords, lakes, etc. Um, and then you've got the actual train effect, uh, train key there. Uh, then you have the box, then you get um, combat results table. And you have two of those, one for each player. Ground combat. Um, air to air combat and a bombing table so that's the same for everyone those are the only three combat tables they're very quite simple as you can see a 1d6 roll with one or two modifiers then the Norwegians have a mobilization table so some of their, their, their units have to be weighted to be mobilized and the Germans on theirs which is on the back of one of these is um they have instead of the mobilization they have a sunk in transit table so I'll tell you about that now. Sorry about all the wobbling. Basically, you can see on there you've got a die roll next to ports. So any ports near Oslo, that's down the south of the map. Um, it, as you transport units from Germany and or Denmark to there, you have to roll a die roll for each unit. On a six, it is sunk. And that is quite nasty because the, the, the unit is destroyed and so you get one point for that, but it's also sunk in transit, so you get double points for it sinking in transit, and that's just on the die roll. So you know that the Germans got that signifies that um, the Allies shipping are interdicting all this area. Now they're not able to interdict this so well, which is why it's only on a one or d six. So you're going to be bringing most of your troops up here, um, and so it goes like that all the way up, and then Trondheim, Nansos, and all ports north. Of the weather line, so Trondheim, I think that's Namsos there. All of those, including Narvik and the ones around there, um, they're not likely to get there. They're likely to get sunk by the Allied forces before they even get there. So that is it's difficult, and that includes getting supplies. And without supplies, obviously, your units have a lot less combat. Uh, I think I can't remember movement effectiveness. So. There's one stipulation to that is the first turn. Now the first turn, the Germans have a special invasion. So it's, you know, the sort of surprise launch before everything's got together by the other forces. And then you can land anywhere and you're only sunk on a six. So on the first turn, I kind of, in the first turn I just played, I sort of dotted my folks about a bit. Most of them coming on here. I thought I'd better get some guys up here. Um, but I, I think in the second game, it would be worth your first turn invasion to be spent putting most of your folks up here. Because from turn two and there on, they're not going to get there by sea. They're likely to going to be sunk. I started looking at then the next likelihood of, okay, which air base do I need so I can transport supplies and reinforcements up to there. Otherwise, those guys were going to get wiped out. And even these guys were a bit precarious very quickly so um that's kind of like gives you a little peek into what the game's about now here's the forces what you get you get these german unit composition chart which includes all the units which are in the german airfields those ones that are off map and then what's called staging now you can see there the first turn you have these two waves the first turn assault wave and a follow-up wave so that assault wave you can send in 15 battalions uh, anywhere on the map, any port, and um, can you send them to non port space? I can't, I can't remember, I have to check that. But and that, that's what they all get in, except on a six when they are sunk. Then, um, you have a follow up wave, then you can do those combats, and in the exploitation phase, you have a follow up wave, it doesn't um, so of 14 more battalions or battalion equivalents, but they will then revert to this. So you see, you can. You can't reinforce um, far north um, uh, in that very easily in that exploitation wave. 
then from the rest of the turns you start staging units. Um, now what does staging mean? Well, the, initial, the German initial order of battle is all of these units. Um, some hexes are six high, these are air units. Um, so they're all available, but you choose at the beginning which battalions are going in in these two waves. And then you can put seven battalions into the staging post here. And that essentially means that on turn two, they will be available to go in either by um, uh, um, water transit or possibly by um, air transportation. Now, so, um, so you decide the composition and, and you, you notice that um, turns one to three you can only stage seven more battalions so the bulk of the troops go in on that first turn and then at first only have seven ready for next turn up to turn four you only begin seven then from turn four on that doubles so the commitment and effort is, is redoubled I suppose I don't know the history of the campaign but perhaps when the Germans saw the effort the Brits rather the, the, rather the Allied forces were making they had to redouble theirs so that's a German initial order battle. You also have German reinforcement charts. So from various turns, these become available, um, therefore into the staging. So you, you can't use all of these, but you can use any of these in that first turn and from then on, plus these as they come in. Um, I'll just give you a quick look then at the German units while we're here. So you, um, I'll go to this unit composition chart. So these are the divisions. There's, I think it's 12 divisions and then potential naval regiment, which is a nice little kind of um, extra colour. It's uh, these units here, which represent um, the crew of destroyers, which are possibly destroyed by the Allied units um, um, during the initial landing. I guess that happened historically. They form themselves up into a combat regiment. Um, so the Germans have the first, the second and the third mountain divisions available and then um, nine more divisions including a motorised division here, the rest are infantry divisions. Now on the, the German initial order has the third mountain and then these infantry divisions available. Then there's non-divisional assets like some um, tanks here, some parachutists, parachute companies knees there and um, anti-aircraft battalions some artillery and then these are the potential to create um, uh, permanent airfields in frozen lake hex sites um, but you can only do that once and uh, once it's can be destroyed and once that happens it's gone then the Germans have all the these Luftwaffe forces so these are squadrons of sort of 10 to 12 planes, Junkers 88A. And for me, the most important um, number at the moment is this, that 40, that's the range. Um, so that means um, 40 minus that number of hexes into um, uh, Norway. So um, that's, those are bombers. You've got Hein called bombers. And then you've got Messerschmitt fighters. Note their very short range. Um, so initially they can only get three hexes from here. So one of the things you're going to do in your first turn is put some of them in these um, airfields. Uh, oh no, those are ports, not airfields. Shoot, well, in that airfield in Denmark and some in Denmark itself, which is closer than Germany. Um, you can put six uh, squadrons in each. Um, then you've got lots of 18 squadrons of Junkers 52 transport units, 25 hex range, and some here. I can't remember, they're, can't remember why they're different colour. You can see they go with the parachutists and that anti aircraft, so that's um, a certain specification of unit. And then I get these uh, um, again, marine. Um, Luftflotte and some Heinkels and apparently this is a, a misprint it's uh, actually another Heinkel and that's just quickly mentioned as a side that this game you can see all these units all the designations that you need on the setup charts 
and everything on here. There's very, very little errata for the game. There's, you know, sort of half an A4 sheet, or not even that, I'd say it's a third. Just a few hexes or, or units misidentified. So I was very impressed with with that. Um, okay, so what else do you have? Um, right below this line are breakdown units. So, so these are divisions, and every division has a headquarter at the top there with the flag, and then you have the brigades. So there's like two brigades, and of um, mountain infantry on the left there, and then a, a brigade of mountain artillery. Then below the the heavy line, you can break them down. But you've only got so many breakdown units. There's more in the mountain troops. There's, there's like six, so I could break down both of those. And that is necessary because um, one Junker's transport can only carry one um, battalion. Uh, so a brigade is three battalions, so um, you need three Junkers um, you know, to take one of those. And you might want to scatter them over a greater area or, or what have you. Um, there's also an option, oh yeah, and it's also important because of this, isn't it? So just apart from the air transportation, you've got the um, amphibious assault wave, and um, you, that's, it comes in battalions, battalion numbers, not in um, brigade numbers, so you might want to break your brigades down for that. But... Um, these can only be broken down. You can only break down one brigade. So this 69th Infantry has got three brigades, infantry brigades, but it's only got three breakdowns. So you see, you have to have a bit of juggling with that. I think essentially what's happening is that, you know, you'll transport some um, into the staging and sort of split them up with different things and then recombine at later turns. But the very interesting... Um, uh, yeah, so... Uh, so these are the divisions, you've got artillery, you've got infantry, and then you have the um, headquarters. Now the headquarters are very interesting because in this game, each hex is, is it 25 miles um, across? I forget, but anyway, you can only stack two units in a hex. Now, the headquarters count as a unit, and a headquarter can absorb all of its subordinate units in which case it goes on to the appropriate headquarters composition. And that effectively means that, um, say you have the 169th Infantry without its headquarters, it's got four units, and so it would have to stack separately in two hexes. If it had its headquarters, they could all stack in one hex and have one unit from another um, division, and perhaps even another whole division that had done the same thing in the hex with it. So you can see the headquarters are supremely important to um, coordinate your forces and allow them to operate effectively in the same area at once. So sorry, I had to just plug my phone in. Um, so um, I found that thing about headquarters is very important because, for example, in the first turn that I just played, um, one of my division's headquarters was sunk. And that was a disaster because essentially then that um, division will never be able to combine like that. It will never have effective stacking um, on the board. So it makes me think that I should use, I should not send in the headquarters um, by uh, um, uh, the amphibious transit or, or rather the sea transit. I should send them in um, once I've secured airfields by air transportation. So it's things like that which is making this game exceedingly interesting. I'll touch that a bit more in a minute, but I'll just talk about these forces. So here you have um, the Norwegian initial order of battle. So in a moment I will take all these off and they get set up on the board. Um, if I can move this a bit closer, I'll just show you some of the detail of that. Oh. Maybe I should just mention what I didn't speak about before. Um, up here you've got supply units. So um, those are essential. You, you can have some captured supply. Germans can. And then you have these control markers, uh, hit markers. 
and this is a particular Europa thing. These markers mark interdicted hexides because in this in the Europa series, um, combat occurs in hex. So there's no zone of controls. You can move past it, an enemy unit in a hex quite fine. But if you go in the hex, every hex site that you use to enter that hex, you put an interdiction marker in. That means that the enemy cannot retreat through that hex. So you can see you can surround the enemy or leave them room to slip out. Um, the hits, I think, are for, uh, for air bases and um, air... Uh, ships and so forth and right and so that's the Norwegian initial order of battle and you might be able to see there um, you've got three um, artillery motifs there they indicate um, essentially ammo dumps so these are not sort of functioning artillery counters yet on the first turn they are stationed in certain areas mostly around Oslo I think there's one up at Trondheim and if they get captured by the Germans, the Germans then get these captured um, supply counters in lieu of those. And uh, niftily, the, um, uh, the Norwegians instead get this unit, which represents the personnel. So they left the, the supplies to um, the invaders, but they're able to form a combat unit after that. So it's, there's lots of nice little colour like that. You'll notice here you also have truck units these can be destroyed but they can also help other units to move around i didn't mention on the map that black lines represent railways and dotted lines represent roads you've mostly got railways represented because each hex that has a row in it also is considered to have a road in it so you can have rail movement a road which is further i can't remember the exact rule um but and road i think these tracks can move quicker faster on a road than other units that's that sort of transportation. Then um, then we begin with the Allied reinforcements. So starting on turn one, the Norwegians actually get some reinforcements. Some of those are far up north. And, and then they get these, which are all important interdiction markers. They only get two. But what they mean is where whichever port they are placed at, um, the Germans cannot transit into. So, for example, on my first turn, the um, Germans had some guys in Narvik. They were looking to reinforce that. And um, the Norwegians just, or rather these are allies, the dark green, the Norwegian forces, they just, inter they represent naval interdiction. That's, um, yes, I think just naval interdiction. And so those units were effectively isolated. They also have... Um, five cruiser task forces. I think this is the number of hits it takes to sink them. Cruiser task forces. They go on and... Oh no, that's the anti-aircraft power. Well, they re so they can be placed in other ports and or the same port. But they represent anti-aircraft defence given to that support by um, Allied shipping. And then the Allies get these, um, not many, but some... Um, air counters, skewers, Blenheims, Wellington and Whitley. Not many squadrons compared to the Germans. And they will go what's called Hatton Field there, which is represented along the edge here, um, which is, I don't know if you can read that, that's between 10 and 5 hexes away from these points. So... You can see um, with the ranges, the longest range they've got here is 24. So they don't actually have the range to reach um, Norway and go back. Um, you can um, mission double your air range, but you have to then land. You cannot go back to where you were, so you have to land in a friendly port within that doubled range. So that is, so essentially those units could stage to Norway from there. Um, then, so there's turn two, you get more reinforcements, turn three, you get more, and then the Allies reinforcements chart continues here all the way up to turn 11. The blank spaces represent units that are recalled, withdrawn as they say. So, for example, on turn two, the, the Carrius Furious comes on, and on turn three, it's withdrawn. Uh, then it comes back on turn 10. On turn... 
Uh, on turn five, the Glorious and the Arc Royal come on, and on turn six, they are drawn. Then they go and come back like that, so they can sort of come on and help stage um, uh, air units or B stages for air units, but then they quickly go back. And that's probably quite good for them because obviously they must be tempting targets for the Germans because they get a lot of victory points. For example, if the Arc Royal is sunk, they get six, the Furious and the Glorious. Give them an eight for the Arc Royal, six and four. So that, you know, the Germans might need those victory points. Um, so, as I said, the dark green were the Norwegians. Now, um, these kind of light tan ones are British units, and um, uh, these are greyer ones are French units. Um, so we are April 9th, 1940, when we start. Um, so the the intent of this campaign, as I understand it, is that um, as it says on the box, is that the Germans wanted to uh, protect their northern flank before their invasion of Nor of uh, France. We also have some Polish units. These are uh, with blue instead of black writing. There's not many, but obviously they're representing ones that survived from the. Um, conquering of Poland by the German forces just the year prior to this. So they are still in the fight. Um, I don't think they get any air uh, specifically. But yeah, so that's all the forces. Um, and over here, that's the Norwegian Armed Forces chart. The black ones just indicate the grey that ones, the ones that are these ones, are these ones that will be on the board. And so they have these other forces that I think are mainly kind of breakdown units and so forth. Oh no, sorry, those come in the mobilisation, yes. That gives me a chance to speak about mobilisation. So on the map, there are these mobilisation centres. Number one's here, two, three, four. So they're dotted around. There's there's sort of one there. You know, there's there's one up near Trondheim. And there's there are, I think, two up here. There's at least one up here. Um... Uh, there's one here, for example, for number 14, it goes all the way up to 16. So that's where you m m mobilised units can enter. And that is where we use that Norwegian mobilisation chart. And you can see it has on it that, so you roll the D6, cross the index with a turn, and that will tell you which centre these units will come in on. Um, and that's all important. Um, again, it's something for the Germans to think about whether to capture those mobilization centers actually i think no i think they just come on adjacent even if you catch it but basically you know the norwegians are able to um gather forces at scattered places throughout the map so that's that is the german dilemma um you know initially how to invade how to keep the allies and the Nor norwegians from narvik how to take all of this and how to play that whack-a-mole game against mobilizing um native forces um is there anything more i want to say yes there's two things i want to say the first is um about um planning and the second is just comparison to operation operation visa rubon now this is not a game which at least as the german player and really i think also as the norwegian allied um you can enter into lightly um you need to plan it now some people that's a pain in the ass but um, especially as a solo player it's kind of like a delight you know because you have you've got your own leisure to do it in and you can also do like what I did you, you play a first one and a half turns and, uh, based on all this planning that you did and um, you discover <laughs> that's never going to work um, so you know you can work that out by a lot more analysis first or a bit of that trial and error but anyway, so, so planning is definitely, um, like I, I've worked out three-phase planning, capture Oslo and Narvik, phase two, get Trondheim, that's the middle of the place, and then phase three, clear out um, southern Norway. Now I would modify that plan, and then I, I worked out, um, okay, which units did I need, which waves did they come in, follow up, and then ha how they would coming on the staging up to the fifth turn. Um, I would modify that now, but I do think you cannot play the game without some of that planning, or else chances are you're going to make have a disaster on your hands. 
more so for the German because you have that onus of invasion, but even for the Allies as well because you have to know, uh, you have to, you don't have that staging um, area that you, you do have to know how you're, I haven't got into this yet myself, but you have to also bring in some Allied forces. There's not a lot of Allied um, ground forces to come in. So there's like a division of Poles. Well, it's not a full division. It's, it's a brigade really of, of Poles. Um, and a division or two, the French division and English division or two, um, but mostly, um, and some assets, but mostly it's about the um, Allied aircraft and um, ships, uh, the ships mainly just being the, um, the carriers, so uh, staging those aircraft. So, you know, you want to know how to help the Norwegians with those and where to, which bases to put them on that are going to be safe because you want, you want your forces in and around Norway, but you don't want them in endangered positions in Norway. So it, it's quite a bit of uh, combined effort needed and between the ground forces and the Allied air and naval there. So the excitement in that planning, I think this would work wonderfully via Vassal. I, I, I bet there is a Vassal module for it. I don't know. I don't really um, come to find I don't really like playing a Vassal. It's difficulty looking at staying at a computer screen for a long period of time for me. But anyway, it would work wonderfully like that because it will play by mail because you have that time. Um, which face-to-face -face is not always, you know, it's a bit of a drag, perhaps. But um, also, I did. there's the first turn planning. The first turn has some special rules. So normal rules that are kind of, like, broken. Um, I mean, to, I, I guess, um, Norwegian allied surprise at the... when the invasion actually occurred, or at least, you know, the, to reflect the German prior preparation. So, for example, the Norwegians tend to retreat before combat in the first turn, which means that you can, as the Germans, send in quite lightly armed troops and gain um, airfields and ports without a fight, but you will have to um, reinforce them quickly um, in that second wave before the Norwegians perhaps come back to to fight in their turn. Um, you also have things like you can actually present some daring landings. You can actually land German air units on um, Norwegian controlled airfields as long as there's not a Norwegian unit actually on it, which I, I think there's only one that is actually on an airfield at the start of the game. Um, but you know, that is risky. I think it's 50% chance of that air unit making it. If it doesn't, it's gone. If it does then some other air units that were sort of circling can follow in. So you've got the those um those slightly risky but um first turn opportunities. So you need to the, the first turn planning is very key for the German and uh, and that has to be related into their longer term plan. So um I'm really um uh, happy, contented to be um, going back to this now and replanning and, and trying to work out what is, is will be a, what hopefully a viable um, invasion plan for the Germans. And uh, then I, I guess turn two, I, or even for the, I, I'd sort of work that all out and, and put it up and then I have to work out the allied, um, the allied counter plan. Because yes, they can stage some units, some air units in. Anyway, I'm babbling a bit, so that's just sort of to try and express that excitement of that planning part of the game. And yes, um, before I go, I just mention. So here's the um, the rule book. Very nice black um, rule book. It's well, it's uh, it doesn't have page numbers, but it's not too many pages. And in fact, um. You've got, uh, it's got a bit of an index. It goes in rules rather than pages. There's 26 rules, but you know, some rules have a lot of subsections like 
rule 9 is transportation lines, rule 10 is ground combat. So rule 10 covers one and a half almost pages of combat. But it's done in the old game designers workshop style, so it's it's not sort of broken down a lot. So there are some things which um you sort of lose it in a paragraph because it's not um fully in it's not indexed. And um but fortunately there are not a lot of rules. It's um and it's very well written and um so far I haven't found any mistakes. There's one or two bits of rata I just made in, but you know it's very clear, very understandable. There was no scratching my head. So the system itself is very sort of clean and uncomplicated. Um, but that there, there's just like quite a few options to it. You, essentially, so the um the main rules go up to rule eleven, supply. So that's you know stacking rule eight, um game length rule six. Um, game components rule four, so you know, not that many. That's only one, two, three, four and a half pages. And then we have the air rules, which take up one, two, three, three pages. And then we go on to reinforcements, naval transportation, naval units, and that all important first turn invasion special rules. And that's it. So the rules are nice, they're sweet, and um, so the complication in the game is, is that planning, it's not figuring out the rules, which is wonderful, which brings me on to Operation Visa Rebuild, which I played first some months ago, and I had Narvik before, but um, I got this and uh, um, the Great Britain one, and I think I got another one maybe case white um which is behind in, in in great britain but i wanted to you know try europa but I'd, I'd sort of been waiting for the right moment and the right moment came and after operation visa Rubin, i can see where this has antecedents in narvik in the sense that this i think um like the same hex combat and so forth and the concentration and it's got more uh, it's brought it, it's the simplicity of it, but you know the sort of various different processes. So this is kind of like I think a simple, a simpler version of Narbi, a very good game I would say too. Um, but it's interesting to see the antecedents I, I assume there. Also to note um, some similarities noting between this and the Empires of Apocalypse series, which is another, which is a favourite series of mine, although it's. Bit more monstrous, it's more monstrous than this, obviously. Um, yeah. So the last word I just like to give to um, kudos to the uh, the good old days. You can see from the graphics, and uh, you know the counters. There's there's nothing on the back. The duochromatic and so forth. It's um the first edition. This came out in nineteen seventy four. And it was just sort of, it wasn't revised, it just included a router. In my edition I got the 1980 flat box edition there. And I don't know if this has been um, uh, revised again and, and reissued by, as the Europa series has, has gone on. But um, shout out to the old school, old style, because I just finished a game, again a very good game called Age of Bismarck, which came out earlier this year. Um, from Fog of War Publications, and uh, that is a card-driven game, so it's a very different beast, and it's, uh, you know, the counters are more colourful and so forth, and you've got all the cards and so forth, it's a very different flavour of thing, and it, it may put me in the mind to, to play my copy of Wellington, which I've now played, Mark McLaughlin's based on the Napoleonic Wars thing, but at an operational rather than a sort of strategic level. I thought, excellent, you know, that um, Age of Bismarck put in the mood of another car-driven game, but it suddenly kind of bulked a bit at the complexity of the car-driven games. Not necessarily the complexity of the system, but um, the complexity of the decisions, what with all those events. And I, so I just came to this, I thought this as a bit of an appetizer. And now it's seeing it's a lot more than that in a good way, and that this is going to be, let's think of it as as like a, 
you know, nice, simple, no nonsense fare. Um, to clear my palate for a bit more of a fancy undertaking later on. But I, I, I can see I'm going to enjoy this game. I, I, um, I, I think I should, um, just for my channel's sake, record some of the play just to show how it, how the systems works, and then um, at least um, a final video, just sort of final thoughts in case you know there's some things about it that did make it grind with me and get bring it to a bit of a crunch. But we shall see. The um, first off is the um, key points is that the uh, the system itself is clean and uncomplicated, and um, the planning required to um, perform the invasion really gives you a sense of getting into the nuts and bolts necessary and insight into what is required in such an operation as this, Narvik, the campaign in Norway. 